<clears throat> I got the flower memo today, Susan. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I hope you guys can hear me. I have like several fans in the background, so. Yep, we can hear you good. I'm okay, um, just good. checking, Maureen, are you on the phone? I am, I'm parking, so I should be in my office <laughs> in like two minutes, but sorry about that, oh. my internet was out. Just wanted to make sure we had everyone here. So good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and we're about to get started. The first item on the agenda is the executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I have a few scheduling announcements and then also want to review some public comments. Uh, sessions that are occurring at the board. So first, I want to remind folks that uh, our schedule for July is listed on our website, our board meeting schedule. I want to highlight a few items. First, that on July 19th, uh, Monday, July 19th, we will be um, hearing from MVP on their rate review requests on for the qualified health plans. That meeting starts at 8 a.m. It is on Teams, and all of the information is located on our press release and website. On Wednesday, July 21st, we then hear from Blue Cross Blue Shield on Vermont on their rate request in the qualified health plans, and that meeting starts at 8 a.m., again, taking place on Teams. And then on Thursday, July 22nd, we have a tentative rate review hearing hold if we need extra time. Then that evening, Thursday, July 22nd, 2021, we have the rate review public comment form that starts at 4 p.m. and goes until 6 p.m. or until it's finished. That again is taking place on Teams and all of the information is on our website and on our press release for July. If you have any questions, please reach out to either me or Abigail Conley. I also want to review a few uh, special public comment sessions. Uh, um, I'll start with some ongoing um, public comment sessions uh, related to the qualified health plans beginning on May 10th and through July 22nd at 11.59 p.m. The board is accepting public comment on the proposed Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and MVP Healthcare Individual and Small Group rate filings for plan year 2022. And you can make your public comment at gmcboard at vermont.gov or by clicking a, a form on our website under our special public comment period page. We also have a new public comment uh, period that I want to announce and that is, um, I'm looking for it. I think I'm on the wrong page, bear with me. It is related to our rule, so I know it is up there. It just didn't refresh on my page. Um, so the board is accepting public comment today, June 30th, 2021 through August 10th, 2021 on the following proposed rule for rules for data submission and data release to replace the current rule that governs data submission and data release for Vermont's All Payer Claims Database, APCD, which is VCURES. Um, a public hearing is also scheduled for August 2nd, 2021 at 2 p.m. The details on that hearing can be found on the Green Mountain Care Board's calendar of events, and there's a link on our public comment uh, webpage. And also information on these rules are located on our web page. So please check that out, members of the public. Last but certainly not least, we have an ongoing public comment period regarding the potential next agreement with CMMI for a next all payer model agreement. The, that public comment period is ongoing. Uh, we have shared and will continue to share those public comments with our colleagues at the Agency of Human Services, as well as the executive branch, as they are taking the lead in the negotiations. And that is all I have to report out today. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, June 23rd. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. 
It's been moved by Member Holmes and seconded by Member Pelham to approve the minutes of Wednesday, June 23rd without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show as unanimous vote on the minutes. So at this time, I'm going to turn the uh, meeting over for the next uh, item on the agenda, which is the um, 2020 annual scale report to Michelle Degree and Sarah Lindbergh. So Michelle and Sarah, whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen. Can you all see that? We can. Okay, excellent. Uh, so as um, Chair Mullen stated, Sarah and I are here today to talk to you about the 2020 or performance year three scale targets and alignment report. Um, so again, 2020, a year that has already passed, uh, but this is you know six months after is when we submit the report. Um, so we will talk a little bit about preliminary 2021 data, but I just want to reinforce that we're talking about last year in the purposes of this um, presentation. Um, so the results for performance years one through three. Um, in performance year three, there were five scale target ACO initiatives operating through contracts between payers and One Care Vermont. Those include the Medicare ACO initiative, the Medicaid Next Gen program, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Commercial Next Gen program, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Primary Program and the MVP Qualified Health Plan Program. Um, so in performance year three, as you can see from this slide, uh, Vermont achieved 47% Medicare scale performance and 45% all payer scale performance. Um, with that, you know, we did not achieve Medicare and all payer scale targets for performance year three. Um, preliminary data that we saw in performance year two kind of already anticipated this result, just like we can see from um, our preliminary 2021 data, sort of where we're headed for that performance year as well, the performance year we're in now, which is performance year four. Um, the APM and agreement anticipates scale will increase over the life of the agreement, and Vermont has previously described challenges to achieving scale in prior scale target reports in the and in the state's response to CMMI's warning notice following last year's scale target report. Um, some of this has to do with engaging hard to reach payers and how scale is actually measured. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm losing my voice. Um, I feel like Secretary Smith the other day. Now I'm losing my voice. I don't know what's happening. Uh, so uh, the uh, APM signatories will continue to work with the ACO and other partners to increase scale. The board through its ACO oversight and monitoring and other regulatory authorities and the governor's administration and agency on human services through strategies outlined in the APM implementation improvement plan, which you'll hear from Secretary Smith and Ina Backus um, a little bit later today. Uh, the GMCB, of course, will continue to monitor new payer programs as they're developed, ensuring services remain in alignment and qualify as scale target initiatives through the ACO budget process. Here's just another sort of quick way to look at this. I think um, one of the things that can sometimes get lost is really the trajectory at which Medicare and all payer scale uh, targets grow. And so um, here's just another view that shows our progress in relation to the targets. So we can see that Medicare trajectory and relatively flat performance um, more clearly, I think, in this uh, graph than in the table version. Um, and of course, preliminary 2021 data show us um, really closing that all payer gap. A quick look at attribution. So performance year three results reflect significant growth in attributed lives in both the Medicaid and commercial programs. Uh, most notably, the number of Medicaid bennies attributed under Vermont Medicaid Next Gen program, which launched in 2017. If you do the math, it's increased nearly 300% since its, its inception um, and 45% uh, growth over performance year two. Uh, similarly, the commercial participation more than doubled from performance year two uh, 
over performance year two. Um, and the additional increase shown there is due in part, uh, in large part, for Medicaid's uh, expanded attribution model in the Medicaid space and in the commercial space um, through 2021 is due in part to the addition of the state employees in 2021 and Blue Cross um, opening up the primary program to a larger book of business. Um, the Medicare growth that you see for preliminary 2021 uh, projections is uh, largely attributed to the Rutland Regional Medical Center joining the ACO program. I will talk briefly about factors influencing scale targets. So there are several factors which contribute to achieving scale. Uh, alignment to a scale target ACO initiative is contingent on provider participation, specifically primary care providers participating in the ACO network, the payers engaging in agreements with the ACO, and the methodology used for attribution. So as discussed previously, success of the provider network are shown through increased participation in the uh, Medicaid model and the comprehensive payment reform program continue to grow in performance year three. Um, also in performance year three, the provider network saw increased participation in both Medicaid and commercial space with the addition of the MVP, as well as independent providers joining the network. In terms of payer participation, there are quite a few challenges, um, you know, including that Vermont's preempted by federal law from influencing self-funded employer groups' choices regarding their health insurance. So with Medicaid <clears throat> and with Medicaid's expanded attribution, they've reached near saturation. They're at about 92% of attributable lives um, in 2020 with uh, their expanded attribution model. Um, and attribution methodology. So challenges to attribution include um, ACO attribution being provider driven and that there can be a disconnect where people live and where they receive care. You hear us talk about that a lot. Uh, the GMCB and CMS will continue to discuss these challenges as they pertain to the Medicare program since initial analyses suggest that achieving scale for Medicare specifically may be near impossible due to this attribution design. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh to talk to you about some um, alternative measures that we have introduced in this year's report. Good morning. My name is Sarah Lindbergh. Uh, I am a data person for the Green Mountain Care Board. Apologies, I don't recall my exact title, director of something related to data. <laughs> and if you could go to slide eight, please, Michelle. So uh, scale is a very complicated thing. I think it's one of those things that um, the measurement challenges might not be as obvious when you're thinking about it, but we thought that putting more context around how this model is really influencing the state of Vermont and its delivery system would be helpful, and especially as we're thinking about how to evolve in the future. And so there were three different ways that we chose to look at scale um, by tweaking the way that it's uh, specified in the model. So the first is we called adjusted scale. And all that that one really does is um, give us credit where we think it's due in the denominator, um, which means that we think it's not really fair to hold us accountable for the Medicare Advantage business, um, since that's already a federally managed uh, capitated arrangement. Um, so without real investment from the federal side of things, it's very difficult for us to have much sway on that population. And it's getting more and more challenging as our uh, more and more Medicare beneficiaries are opting for Medicare Advantage plans. The other thing that we think is pretty unfair is that uh, we are accountable for self-funded groups, even if we have none of their data. So due to uh, infamous decision by the US Supreme Court, uh, the GOBE decision, self-funded groups often don't have to submit data to us anymore. And so it's hard to reach out to people you don't know about or only theoretically know about. So this first measure just says, let's, let's be fair to ourselves and figure out what scale would look like um, under the terms of the model if we take those groups out of the denominator. The other two measures kind of flip it from looking at um, Vermont residents and instead looking kind of at the provider side of this model. Uh, the first of these is we called the proportion of Vermont hospital revenue. And basically that says, you know, of all the revenue that's coming to hospitals on behalf of Vermont residents, how much of it has really changed as a result of the all-payer model. So how many of these risk-based 
value incentivized payments are flowing through the system. And that I think is a better measure of how well the APM, APM is helping to penetrate the payment delivery system at Vermont's hospitals. And the last measure is kind of looking at theoretically how many providers could even attribute to this model. So we looked at our best estimate of licensed and active providers in the primary care setting statewide and looked at how many of those are already participating in the ACO network. So if you could go to slide nine, please. We'll start by looking at that adjusted scale. So this is um, showing the recalculated results from the first perform official performance year in 2018 through our preliminary estimate uh, for the current year, 2021. So uh, we still need some numbers uh, to finish our calculations for the current year, but you'll see that we start with the um, estimated all-payer scale denominator, back out those Medicare Advantage beneficiaries, back out the self-funded lives we're estimating um, that are not in VCURES, and then we reach this adjusted denominator. And then we see what scale would look like based on that. And so we're still short of the target each year, but much closer um, with our projections showing that we likely would meet the target in 2021. I think this also demonstrates why commercial participation is still very critical in um, making sure that this model penetrates um, all the, the full Vermont population. So that's really what's made the difference in performance years three and four. And then slide 10 is that proportion of the hospital revenue. So uh, what we said is, okay, let's look at any prospective payment a hospital is getting from the ACO as well as other reform payments. So those would be those associated with primary care medical homes, community health teams, and the other um, types of programs like that, and compare that with um, those payments in addition to the net patient revenue the hospital receives. But to be fair in this calculation, what we really need to do is estimate how much of that revenue is coming from Vermont residents. Um, this model is largely constrained to Vermont residents based on attribution, and so you need to make sure that you're adjusting for that before you can properly calculate this proportion. And so then you'll see back in uh, the pilot year that Medicaid did, we had about 1.9% of value-based payments. And this current, uh, I'm sorry, this previous year that we've just closed in 2020 was up to just under 16%. So I think that probably lags behind our hopes, but is certainly um, promising that it continues to increase I also want to make clear that uh, these fixed payments um, are, or I should say prospective payments, are flowing from one care to the hospitals. There is not a fixed prospective payment as part of the all-payer model flowing directly from a payer to a hospital. And so I think that um, we've maybe garbled some of that in our previous um, conversations and presentations. So. The payment arrangements under the ACO are under the purview of the ACO, and so those are reconciled and, and managed within that network. The actual fixed payment happens from the payer to the ACO. And finally, slide 11, um, I think is, is one of the most compelling in my book, and that's showing that 90% you know, of primary care providers in the state are already participating in the ACO. So that, that's a pretty good, pretty impressive number. And that's kind of showing you that, um, you know, they might not be participating in all three programs, but they they are showing an investment. And I think that's what a testament to how important having um, this be a provider-led initiative is to getting buy-in. So slide uh, 12, uh, I guess we'll just skip right ahead to slide 13, <laughs> that's fine. So then we can talk a little bit about um, the Medicare target in particular. So uh, Medicare scale is a bit of an enigma. It is a algorithm that is run by the federal government. And despite both the best efforts here in the state of Vermont and also on behalf of our federal contractors who are doing the analytics uh, for CMS, no one's having much luck replicating the algorithm. And unfortunately, uh, the system that provides uh, performs the attribution for Medicare is kind of a legacy mainframe system. So we can't kind of just pull out the code and see what it's doing to try and improve our methods. So 
that's made it a little bit challenging to detect what might be going on or to kind of figure out how to um, analyze uh, some of these target shortfalls. It's also a very important thing to flag in future agreements so that we um, can actually model this <laughs> and address it on our side of the equation. But uh, just uh, not all Medicare beneficiaries in Vermont are eligible to be attributed to the all-payer model through Medicare. And there might be different reasons for that. Uh, they, For instance, they are supposed to live in the United States for the full year. Uh, they're supposed to have both Part A and Part B coverage, and they're not supposed to sign up for Medicare Advantage. If they do that, they kind of are wiped out um, from the Medicare attribution process. And so once you make those just eligibility-based adjustments, um, you know, we lose quite a few beneficiaries. So we did this analysis um, in performance years 19 and 20, and we had about 93,000 eligible beneficiaries, which is a drop of 20,000 folks. Um, so if we look at that um, denominator, our scale performance does improve. Uh, we're about 20 percentage points below the target um, instead of 30 percentage points, so still shows some room to grow. But the other um, adjustment that is not accounted for here and is, again, a challenge with our limitations in understanding how attribution is performed pro programmatically is that some of the Medicare beneficiaries actually have primary care relationships outside of the state of Vermont. So that usually is either in New Hampshire, and we actually have quite a few people who have a primary care relationship in Florida based on the model due to our snowbirds. And so we think that even um, that adjustment would probably improve a little bit more, but it's a hard thing to unfortunately model uh, effectively and again, is something that we are tracking in future developments uh, as we think about uh, new models. And uh, I guess I'll turn it back over to Michelle to wrap this up. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Uh, yeah, so just a few, you know, highlights. You know, the performance three performance year three results do show progress, but ultimately we did fall short of the target. Um, again, this has been known and clear to us since our performance year two report was released. Uh, the APM Im implementation improvement plan was created in 2020 to address issues with scale participation with the expectation that scale would increase in 2021 and beyond as a result of those efforts and our preliminary 2021 data are showing just that. Um, and just an overview that the alternate measures of scale are provided to offer a fuller picture of statewide scope. Um, again, penetration at the provider level is high uh, and that FPP is continuing to grow as the model expands. And that's all we have for you. So I'll turn it back to you, Chair Mullen, for uh, questions. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Sarah. Um, members of the board, do you have any questions for Michelle or Sarah or any comments? This is Robin. Um, Thank you, Michelle and Sarah, uh, for a very thorough report. And I um, really appreciate your additional analytics and thinking around the alternative measures of scale, because I think as Michelle just said, uh, it was clear as a performance year two that the Medicare scale targets were really just off base, quite frankly. And while that uh, was not at all known at the time of the negotiation, um, I think now that we know it, having these other measures to uh, judge progress is really important and a good way uh, for us to understand uh, how the model is really uh, changing over time. Um, so I appreciate that a lot. Also, um, I think that there is there has been some great progress and that is shown in the all pair model uh, target in terms of particularly the work that AHS has done around um, bringing in state employees and thinking about how to move forward in the self-funded. So uh, that is, I think, interesting, and I'm glad to see that included as well. So th those are my comments, and thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Are there other members of the board? Yeah, I'd like to comment. I, um, you know, I, I 
when I first came on the board, I uh, you know took a look at at these targets, and the one that I was most comfortable with and familiar with was the three and a half percent per member per month growth rate. And I could actually go back and figure out where that came from. Um, it was uh, Jeff Carr and Tom Givet's work um, profiling the growth in the Vermont uh, growth, growth state product from 2001 to 2016, that 15 year period. And it's you know the three and a half percent is within a tenth of a point of that. But the scale targets, these targets are for me much more difficult and I worry, and I think we're getting to the point of correcting, but I worry that we, uh, that the process of establishing these targets was too aggressive, maybe too much negotiated and not based on uh, any kind of um, uh, statistical you know, study. Uh, and if, if, if such exists, I'd like to see it. But I just, I just worry that, that we, we give these, uh, the 70% target and the 90% target uh, the sacred standing of which we kind of beat our head against uh, when uh, if one goes back and look looks at it from the beginning, the fair conclusion might be it was too ambitious, um, not well documented. And uh, the kinds of changes that um, uh, Sarah and and Michelle described <coughs> uh, are are reasonable and should be taken very seriously. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Other questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, I'll open it up for public comment or questions. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment at this time? Hearing none, I wish to uh, thank both uh, Michelle and Sarah again in that uh, um, this report is being sent to um, Washington um, and uh, they will have that uh, today. And uh, again, thank you to the staff for everyone who contributed to that work. And um, with that, we will move on to the next item on the agenda. So next I'd like to welcome Secretary Smith and Director Backus to the meeting. And um, Mike and Nina are going to give us an update uh, from AHS. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have you at our meeting. So Secretary Smith, Director Backus, I'm not sure who's going to lead off, but whenever you're ready, take it away. Well, what's really dangerous, Mr. Chair, is uh, Edith's going to let me lead off, which is uh, <laughs> always dangerous. And she can clean up anything that I uh, say afterwards. So. I do want to thank you. I do want to thank you for pointing out on the scale targets some of the um, some of the issues that are associated with the scale targets. Meaning that when we negotiated the agree the agreement, and it's nobody's fault. N nobody had done this before in 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 the country. Um, that we when we no negotiated the agreement, we threw everything into the denominator in terms of attributed lives. And in the numerator, we could only use a, a percentage of that uh, denominator in terms of attributing, really attributing lives. And you're going to have a gap. It's just going to happen uh, as you move forward. So I do appreciate, you know, we're going to be obviously looking at in any sort of renewal of how you, how you change that. And I really appreciate some of the suggestions today. Uh, particularly, you know, the participants of providers, 90%, for example, that's pretty impressive. But I really do um, do appreciate uh, the work that's been done here. And it's not surprising when you do that. When you limit the what you can put in the numerator and you throw everything in the denominator, you're going to have this gap as, as you move forward. We are moving you know, 2021 looks um, encouraging as we move forward. And and one of the things that you talked about that makes it look encouraging are coming up some of the things that we did and some of the things that we talked about in the uh, improvement plan, some of the things that you're looking at as well. For example, state employee health plan participation, that was 12,675 uh, individuals that come into the um, 
into uh, the uh, scaled targets. Uh, Rutland Regional on the Medicare uh, beneficiary side, uh, 7,500. Uh, you know, those help uh, in a smaller state. Those kind of attributions help as we move forward. But there's other things that we are doing as well. We're looking at, um, you know, one of the things that um, some of the providers were saying, well, we need more guidance on how we sort of can align our prospective payments. And with Medicare, remember that you have to sort of reconcile. Um, and they needed more guidance on that. And we're helping them uh, with the guidance on that in order to uh, move more effectively and efficiently uh, through the system. You know, you're, you're looking at the ACO scaled strategy and keeping uh, tabs on how the ACO is looking at scaled strategy. We are um, starting to engage self-funded groups. We're starting to engage payer engagement. Um, as you know, we, put, we provided a lot of money in stabilization grants to shore up uh, the healthcare system during uh, the pandemic. But one of the things that I, I, I want to spend some time on that we're looking at um, is that this, this movement, and I've really become a champion of this, this movement to true fixed payments in all, all our systems, whether it's commercial, Medicaid, as you know, we're pretty, we're pretty uh, advanced in Medicaid in terms of fixed payments, but also in Medicare um, as we move forward. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about um, that we are particularly looking at as we negotiate a, another agreement. And we're, we're still trying to determine um, whether it's a year uh, extension, whether it's uh, more than a year, there seemingly is mutual interest in moving Medicare to a value-based payment system. Um, and if we can achieve that, we can bring in the commercials, we can continue doing what we're doing in Medi Medicaid, we're at a value-based payment. And let me tell you why that's important. I saw that uh, the value-based payment happen during the pandemic when prospective payments shored up everything. Uh, it, it provided cash flow, it, it provided everything because we had shut down the system uh, for elective surgeries. And so there was no money coming in. Um, the prospective payments allowed cash flows, uh, cash, flow, cash flow to happen. But I want to be clear. I, I, I'm committed to moving away from fee-for-service reimbursement um, for this reason. I think it's perverse. Uh, I think it rewards all the wrong things uh, as we move forward. Um, you know, it today sort of the healthcare system operates to make money on each additional and more costly procedure, even if the person isn't better off. And instead of this payment model, I want to move to a different payment model that gives you a fixed fee payment, that gives you a perspective payment, that or a value base. There's a lot of words that all mean the same in that we need to give the system a predictable budget and upfront money so that they can focus on keeping Vermonters healthy instead of uh, ringing up a tab. And at the highest level, at the highest level, this is called a value based payment. Um, and that means across all payers. It means Medicaid, Medicare, uh, commercial insurance. I think we have a window of an opportunity here with Medicare uh, as we start talking about the all-payer negotiations. Now, the all-payer, um, there's different things going on here, a lot of things going on. Um, there is the global commitment waiver, which ends at this year. There is the all-payer model waiver that end, they're all 1115, but that, that ends in 22. But we're negotiating, they're connected, and we're negotiating with the eye on both as we're, as we're moving uh, through these various models. Um, so the idea here is 
to really focus on the major types of health coverage um, and make sure that they pay in the same way, they commit to improving population health, and then providers have a consistent incentive across the board and a reduction in administrative cost. And that's what we're trying to do here as we look at the all-payer model, as we connect it to the global commitment uh, model. Um, and we've seen some success in Medicaid, for example. Um, you know, when we look at the Medicaid budget, it's grown on an average of 1.45% uh, compared to an average of 5.23% in the five years preceding sort of the model. We also highlight how important it is for Medicare to move even closer to Medicaid in how it pays, you know, as we talk to the federal government. So the improvement plan, um, you know, we talked about the scale, but you know what and we talked about various alternatives that we certainly will take into the negotiations um and, and talk about but what i want to leave you with is um i'm really committed to this this um value-based payment at the highest level we'll call it value-based payment i'm really committed to this value-based payment payment or fixed fee and I'm committed to moving as quickly as possible. If there's an opportunity, I'm gonna take advantage of it uh, to move as quickly as possible. And right now the federal government is saying to us there may be an opportunity. Um, so I am uh, looking at that. I just wanted to give you an update of where we are in the, the negotiations. And, uh, and for one meeting in the last two days, I haven't lost my voice, which is uh, amazing. Um, so with that, I'll take uh, questions from the board, Mr. Chair. Super. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Questions from the board or comments? Tom? Me? Oh, I thought you lit up in blue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to jump in if you aren't ready, Tom. Well, I'll just bring up one one topic gently um, that concerns me, and that is the cost shift. You know, uh, going into this last legislative session, the presentation to the emergency board clearly stated uh, from DIVA that um, there would be no uh, rate increases, Medicaid rate increases in 2021, but for um, any that are federally required, and that had mostly to do with FQHCs. And um, and so I, I just worry that and and clearly the cost shift is not fixable. I mean it's something we're going to have to live with forever. It's such a big number. You know our calculation is that it's uh, uh, for 2020 it was like something like 240 million dollars, 250 million dollars. And I I did take a look at the uh, data that um, CMS has required Vermont all hospitals across the, the nation to present. And if you look at the 70 shoppable uh, procedure codes, uh, the Medicaid payment in Vermont from uh, to uh, uh, UVMMC um, in, in comparison to um, <clears throat> the Blue Cross Blue Shield payment rate is 42%. So the, the cost shift exists, it's, and, and it, it's, a, it's a big force. And I worry that, um, that or I hope, I'll, I'll talk about hope, I hope that we can find a path forward with Medicaid that very slowly and incrementally increases the the either the payment rate or the fixed prospective rate that is based on the payment rate, um, so that it doesn't um, act as kind of a siphon. I, I worry that that the all pair model might be successful. That that as we move up the number for fixed prospective payments to something where we're at a purely at a good leveraging point. For the innovations that people say can be delivered, but that that gets kind of uh, sucked away in terms of one of the major players being Medicaid, you know, just kind of standing still. Even and so, you know, if some kind of program like, you know, a commitment to a two percent money increase, especially in an environment where the Vermont population is aging, you know, and and migrating from Medicaid to Medicare. Um, so, and that 2% is 1% new money and 1% efficiencies. I don't know, 
um, but trying to find some way that providers out there have some assurance that uh, that the cost shift isn't maybe going to be fixed, mm -hmm. but that it's not going to get any worse. And so that can be part of the of of the uh, understanding that we have as a community that um, uh, we'll we'll do the best we can to get the Medicaid payment rates up. It's just um, just my, my my concern. Noted, uh, Commissioner of Health. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that a finance commissioner never changes his stripes. <laughs> I know. Well, you, you, you could at least have said duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Robin. Yes, thank you, Secretary Smith, for joining us today and laying out um, your vision and commitment. I really appreciate that. Um, I share your commitment to value-based payment um, and would love to see us as a state move towards greater fixed payments, particularly, or true fixed payments um, as part of a value-based system, particularly for uh, the hospital sector. And I think there has been some good success in One Care's comprehensive primary care pilot for primary care as well. Um, so I'm hopeful that we as a state can further develop that vision uh, moving forward into the next federal agreement um, related to Medicare. Um, I also, just as a practical matter, think that the idea of a one-year or fairly short-term extension makes sense, just given everything uh, that had faced the state related to the pandemic. I feel like we've really lost uh, a year, year and a half, maybe a full two by the time we get through all this. Um, in the all pair model, which just from a data perspective makes it challenging, as well as I think from a delivery system transformation, when providers needed to really focus on transforming for the pandemic, you know, that took away bandwidth from transforming um, around the payment reform that we've been working towards. So um, I, I think that's a great idea, and I think it would help us then move forward and give us time as a state to fully develop what a uh, what the next version is moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to to share those thoughts um, with you and the public, and um, also just say thanks for your leadership around the self-insured employers and the state employees. I think that's a role that uh, really the isn't particularly amenable to a regulatory body participating in. So we really needed uh, that leadership from you and we, I appreciate it. So those are my thoughts. Well, thank you for the thoughts. Um, one of the things I just wanted to, I mean, we're looking at a year extension, but if there's an opportunity to bring Medicare into the value-based payment and the, the, the offset of that is to go a little bit longer, I just want to, I, I just, you know, in negotiations, I may take advantage of it. Sure, sure. That, I mean, that makes, it makes sense. And I think, you know, I, a lot of the, there's a lot of flexibility, quite frankly, in the current agreement around moving the Medicare payment um, that, quite frankly, just there hasn't been the bandwidth to pursue um, given the pandemic and those sorts of things. So it, it seems to me like those are not mutually exclusive and it makes sense to see how it goes. It's always, having been in some of these federal uh, negotiations, you do have to be a little flexible. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Other members of the board? Sure, I will. Uh jump in here. I just want to thank you, Secretary Smith, for coming today, as always, um, your leadership on the pandemic and your leadership with uh, taking, you know, some, some charge of these negotiations with the federal government. Um, I, too, uh, completely agree with you and that we need to move away from fee-for-service and fully support true fixed payments by all three payers or all three types of payers. Um, appreciate the need to maybe uh, extend the agreement for a year, but also appreciate if they can, you know, hasten the movement of getting Medicare into true fixed payment without reconciliation seems to be the way to go. That seems to be a major obstacle to participation and true delivery reform. I'm wondering if you have thoughts around what the greatest obstacles might be to getting the commercial market to true fixed payment. I mean, I think, you know, Medicaid has done a fantastic job. Medicare will involve some negotiations. How do we get the commercial side of the market into true fixed payment? 
That's really a great question. And I, I don't have an answer to that right now because I haven't really started to engage the commercial market. Um, <laughs> as you noted, I've been a little busy on something else, so I haven't really had the opportunity to engage them. That's on my plate to start engaging, to find out what are some of the obstacles uh, to that and what are some of the opportunities as well. I mean, my first, my first thought was let's push forward with Medicare um, we, and we have Medicaid and Medicare. We're sort of homegrown with the commercials in a way. Um, maybe we can have a, as as equal success with them if we have Medicare and Medicaid sort of aligned as well. So I I, I can't answer your question right now because I don't know the answer to it. But it's a question I'm going to ask in the next 30 to uh, 60 days. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay, other comments or questions from the board? Uh, sure. First, thank you very much for the presentation. And, you know, I think adding to, you know, along with trying to get the commercial side, you know, how do we how do we get beyond the hospitals and the private practice um, and other areas as well? So I think to, you know, to truly be able to get into that, you know, fixed payment across the whole system. Um, mm -hmm. So. So any help you can get there, there as well would be helpful. But but this presentation was great. Thank you. Yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't work properly unless we can get all three participants into this into the value based or fixed uh, payment system, and and that's my goal here. Great. Thank you. Okay, anything else from the board? If not, at this time, I'm going to open it up for a public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment at this time? And I'm going to. I've got to, a question, Kevin. I've got um, a question, Kevin. It's Ham. Is that Ham? Yes, sir. Okay, Ham Davis. Um, thank you. Um, on this, <clears throat> one of the things that's happening is that the you get we're having a conversation here that's highly technical, policy analysts and people that are totally can totally on to, into this. The thing that strikes me as a huge problem is that um, what's, what seems to be going on as far as the public is what, and what the public can actually see is that the, that the auditor, uh, Doug Hoffer, okay, is running an obvious attack on the whole system and is trying to build a case, but not, re, not re going in for another five-year thing in point, another five-year term in the in the uh, in December uh, so my question my first question is this um, one of the problems is that that uh, Hoffa uses a lot of numbers but our guys our side never uses numbers okay and so my question is it, we have we have huge capability between the Green Mountain Care Board and AHS in the both the financial and the policy side and so my question is we started the, with the reform in the reform in uh, from 2013 when it really started until now. Okay, needs to, the, my my figures show that from 2013 to 2019, we have, Vermont has avoided 1.9 billion dollars. Okay, in in spending that they didn't have to pay. So what I'm asking, what I want to know is, is there somebody in either the Grand Mountain Care Board? or AHS who can have any number at all. What have we got so far? Have we saved any money? If you can't answer that question, you're gonna get nowhere with the public and nowhere with the legislature. Well, here's what I can do, Ham. Um, and it depends on where you start and where you end when you look at figures. If you take for example, the health cons consumption expenditures and compare Vermont to um, the U.S. in total. Um, you know, every year we were over the U.S. average, except 2007, up until uh, 2010. From 2011, uh, I believe from 2011 on, we've been under the national uh, average. And if you look at um, the first performance year of the model, 
uh, which was, uh, in essence, was 2018 for expenditure reasons, you can see that the national average of healthcare uh, growth in health consumption expenditures was 4.7%, and we were 1.9%. Now, this bounces around, um, but it does display sort of what I think you're talking about. And, and if you say, like, from 2000 to now that expenditures grew X amount, yeah, they did. Um, matter of fact, they grew quite heavily from 2000 to uh, uh, 2010. Um, but they have moderated in this year compared to the national average. And, and I, I think you got to use some of the statistics um, in comparison to other places about how we're doing. Um, and and that's, that's how I look at it. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it, 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 well in a, it talks about it in the same area. What you need to do is to convert it to money. My, I, be, I have the figures. The, I, have, I have the figures on 2000 to 2009. In 2010, there was a huge drop because of the 2008 recession, and, and uh, L, uh, surgery, a lot of surgery procedures disappeared. In 2011 and 2012, the cap was not set by any regulatory body. It was established by the legislature in Act 48, okay? So the comparison needs to be, what is 2000 to not 2009 compared to 2013 to 2019? The model didn't start in 18. The model started in 13 because the model involves both regulation and then trying to change for, to, from away from fee for service. But the model, the reform effort, the Vermont reform effort runs from 2013 to 2019. And nobody has put a single figure. Take the figures you just described. What does that, t you're not gonna be able to talk to Hoffer unless you get a number. He's saying that what we spent, what, we, what we've done is lose a ton of money. Now what the public is gonna hear and what the legislature is gonna hear is, Vermont reform has cost Vermonters a lot of money. They've lost a lot of money. Okay, if nobody can say anything about that, then you're going to get nowhere because you cannot do this kind of reform unless you can take the public and the legislature with you. That's a comment, I understand. Thank you. So I appreciate that, uh, Ham. And if I could just jump into that dialogue. Um, and in, in this in no way is disrespectful to the state auditor because I appreciate the work that he's doing. But Ham, um, the true gold standard for a measurement of the all pair model is um, that evaluation, which is being conducted by the University of Chicago, NORC. And um, that NORC evaluation, although the auditor is correct that a full evaluation of the model won't be out for years, um, we know that there will be um, a preliminary investigation of the initial couple of years. That evaluation will be out later this year. And so um, that's a true independent evaluation. Um, it's it's not being, um, you know, led by anybody that's trying to justify the existence of the all-payer model. And uh, I think that uh, you're going to have... Um, um, that evaluation for at least the first couple of years, Ham, later this year. And I think that will be a major help to everyone as we move forward. Well, I, that, I just disagree with that, Kevin, and I just respect your view. The, it seems to me that you've got to have a number. And the, the, what the both, the, both the, the Scott administration and the Green Mountain Care Board is paid to do is to get what's to, to work to get this system to work to help Vermonters. And, and the fact is the numbers are there, NORC or SMORC. The reality, the numbers exist. We've got them all. Whether they, the Vermont, the people in Chicago are not gonna have a single number that we don't have. And, and so what you have is an aggressive player in Hoffer. You may respect him, but I don't. The, the, you get an aggressive player who's manipulating the numbers to show how bad it is. Okay. So you don't have to even talk about it. You don't have to mention Hopper. What you need to do is get the, you've got the numbers and you want to tell people what those numbers are. Never mind what Nork thinks. Excuse me. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Ham. Mess message received. Um, next, I'm going to call on Eric Strong. Eric. I 
I see a hand up from Eric Strong. Are you? Are you there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it should be Julie Wasserman. I'm not exactly sure why it says Eric Strong, but it's Julie Wasserman. Uh, and I have a, a, a question. Thanks, Go ahead. Um, so it's for um, Secretary Smith. Um, the uh, Agency of Human Services has just submitted a, its application for the Global Commitment Medicaid Waiver Renewal. Um, in that application, uh, AHS is planning to have DIVA become a public state-run risk-bearing Medicaid managed care organization. Um, uh, AHS will pay DIVA a monthly capitation rate for each Medicaid enrollee. So um, if DIVA is running Medicaid, bearing the risk of capitated payments, uh, addressing population health, which is also part of the application, and reinvesting its savings into Medicaid programs, um, it appears to some that uh, this is um, what the ACO has done, but um, if the state's going to do it, then it um, seems that the ACO is, is uh, being duplicative, uh, having the ACO would be duplicate duplicative. So my question for you, Secretary Smith, is what role will the ACO play with uh, starting January 1 with the renewal of the global commitment, um, having the state be a risk-bearing Medicaid managed care organization that bears risk and reinvests its savings? So uh, thank you for the question. Let me just um, sort of frame up this question. In 2005, there was a uh, Secretary of Human Services that came up with this strange idea that just give us the money, let us pay for it, let us use it the way that we want to, and any of the savings that we have will reinvest into the Medicaid program. It was called Global Commitment, and it was an 1115 waiver. Um, and um, I, I wish I could take all the credit for it, but there were a lot of people that were working on that uh, that waiver. It was a unique concept where we set up an MCO, which was uh, OVA at the time, a managed care organization, and use that mechanism, which was never done before, never uh, accomplished before, use that mechanism in order to um, to use Medicaid in a much different way. It gave us so much flexibility in how to use Medicaid, maybe too much flexibility. And ultimately the federal government thought that too and started to rein in the flexibility uh, that we had in, in the Medicaid model. We've started, lo we started losing some of the advantages that we had in, uh, in, in over the years as Medicaid started to put rules on rules on rules um, but we haven't really, we, we've sort of changed our designation, but we still pay a capitated payment through AHS um, to, D, to DIVA now, and that hasn't really changed. What I have said is, let's go back to the NCO model. Let's go under the rules now that they have under the NCO model because they're mature enough. We know what the playing field is. Let's move into that. So nothing really changes in terms of of there'll be some there'll be some organizational changes that we'll have to do within AHS, but that how we use the ACO, which is um, sort of through using it as a funding me mechanism to get out to providers, I don't think it's going to change all that much, um, and I don't think it's going to be duplicative because it's basically what we're doing now, just under a different model, under different rules and gives us more flexibility. I want to eliminate the investments. We have, we have caps now on caps, and I, I don't understand how that happens, but, but we, want to invest, we want to eliminate those investment caps in the 1115 waiver. And I know half the audience that I'm talking to, um, I'm, I'm losing, but you know we have, we have an overall budget neutrality cap that we've always had. Um, and then now since 2016, we have investment caps. In there, I want to eliminate all that cap and just have one cap like we used to, um, and so I don't see um, the the outward mechanisms changing. I do see the inward mechanisms changing, and and what rules we have to follow as we move forward. I hope I answered your question. Um, 
Kind of. <laughs> I guess my concern is that when medic, when the state is bearing the risk, that's a very different model than when the ACO is bearing the risk. And when the state gets to reinvest its savings, that's a very different model than the ACO having the savings to do uh, their, you know, their approach to reinvestment. Yeah, but we we've had this experience for many, many years in terms of 2005 to about 2016. And the, the experience we've had from 2016 on is not that much different. It's just under a, a really um, wonky, funky model that the government put us in that nobody understands, including the federal government right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> is there other public comment? Is, is there other public comment? I see no hands raised and I'm not hearing from anyone. So um, thank you, Secretary Smith. Thank you, Director Backus. Um, it was a great conversation and uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, see you and to uh, work with you. We know that you're dedicated to uh, making healthcare better in Vermont and uh, we look forward to uh, marching with you on that mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. So at this point, we are going to um, change gears and we're going to um, move the conversation to a request for a waiver from um, Clover Health Partners, LLC. And I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Russ McCracken. Russ. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of slides I'm gonna present here. And so hopefully you can see my screen. We can. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to endeavor to frame the discussion of Clover Health's waiver request, uh, which Clover Health presented to the board last week. Um, to that end, there are three parts to this, this short presentation. Uh, the first is setting out Clover's request in the context of the basic regulatory framework. Um, the second is to uh, make note of some reports concerning Clover Health, which has been an area of public comment. And lastly, to uh, hopefully help identify some specific decision points uh, for the board with respect to this, this request. Um, a, a quick note, the slides that were posted yesterday had a omission. Um, that's been fixed and the corrected slides were posted this morning. And I'm uh, using the corrected slides here. Uh, so as an overview, as, as Clover testified last week, as a direct contracting entity, um, they are treated as an ACO and subject to the board's oversight under um, statute in 18 BSA 9382 and the board's rule, uh, ACO oversight rule 5.0. Um, Clover Health is a Medicare-only ACO in Vermont, and it's not subject to the certification requirement. That comes from the statute. Uh, which says that to be eligible to receive payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance through any payment reform program or initiative, an ACO needs to be certified. As Medicare only, uh, Clover Health uh, is receiving neither Medicaid nor commercial insurance through payment reform programs. And so they are not required to be certified to operate in Vermont. Uh, this is relevant because the question before the board is not whether to allow Clover Health to operate in Vermont or whether to certify Clover, uh, but rather the question is under what conditions Clover Health operates in Vermont. And specifically, it's whether Clover Health's budget is subject to review and approval and whether Clover is subject to the reporting enforcement provisions of the, of the rule. Um, the ACO oversight statute and the board rule, uh, under the ACO oversight statute, the board adopts rules to establish the standards and processes for reviewing, modifying, and approving ACO budgets. Uh, rule 5 implements that statute. Both the statute and the rule uh, treat budget review for ACOs with fewer than 10,000 attributed lives differently than ACOs with uh, 10,000 or more lives. Um, specifically, in reviewing the budgets of ACOs with 10,000 or more lives, 
the board must take into consideration the criteria listed in 9382B1, but for ACOs with less than 10,000 lives, and this is the group that Clover presently falls into, uh, the board reviews the budget, taking into account only those statutory criteria that the board deems appropriate to the ACO size and scope. That comes from the, the rule, and I think the relevance of this will be um, clear in, in, as we go through the decision points. Um, next, I wanted to note uh, that there have been public comments regarding reports of investigations and litigation that Clover is facing. Uh, Chair Mellon brought this up last week in questions to Clover Health. Um, in light of the comments and the chair's questions, it seems useful to run through uh, what the, those reports have been. Um, I, ha I have a slight caveat here that uh, we're not in a position to draw conclusions about the accuracy of the reports, the materiality of any investigations or merits of any litigation. Uh, so this is to note that these reports and disclosure and responses exist. Uh, on February 4th, there was a Wall Street firm called Hindenburg Research. It issued a report, uh, a lengthy report, fairly lengthy report on Clover Health. A part of that report said that in October of 2020, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Philadelphia issued a civil investigative demand to a former Clo Clover employee. Uh, Hindenburg posted a copy of that demand letter with their report. Uh, the demand letter says it's part of a False Claims Act investigation, and it required Clover's former employee to provide oral testimony uh, on a dozen different topics um, relating to patient recruitment, uh, patients for or payments for patient recruitment and generating leads, referral payments, uh, and any activity intended to discourage providers uh, to refuse to accept patients with non-Clover coverage. Um, the, these questions appear to me related to Clover's Medicare uh, Advantage plans. Uh, Clover responded to the report on February 5th at length, emphatically denying any violation of law or regulation and saying it had only received a request for information from the DOJ, which it complied with. Uh, Clover generally said they're a heavily regulated entity, uh, as are other organizations that participate, uh, provide Medicare Advantage plans, and they frequently receive requests for information from regulatory bodies. Uh, Clover also referred the board to this response uh, during its presentation. Also on February 5th, the SEC commenced an investigation uh, relating to aspects of Clover Health's business and allegations in the Hindenburg report that was disclosed in uh, Clover's public filings. Also disclosed in, in Clover's public filings, its um, directors and officers are defendants in securities class action lawsuits and a shareholder derivative lawsuit, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, which were filed in February 2020. And Clover describes them as generally based on the allegations in the Hindenburg research piece. Um, I took a quick scan of those complaints, and I think that is an accurate characterization of them. Uh, noted in 2016, CMS imposed a monetary fine of $106,000 on Clover for inaccurate statements that out-of-network providers were obligated to accept Clover enrollees. According to the letter, Clover failed to correct the misleading statements uh, after repeated notifications from CMS. And separately, I'll note because, because it was subject of a article in the New York Daily News this month, um, there's a for-profit hospital group in New Jersey called CarePoint that is owned or was owned by uh, Clover CEO. Uh, that hospital group was subject to news reports from a couple of years ago regarding the high prices it charges, um, including one analysis that characterized it, one of those hospitals as the most expensive in the country. And additionally, an investigation by the state of New Jersey um, regarding payment of management fees by that, that hospital group. Uh, it was not Clover, it was um, a hospital group owned by the, the Clover CEO. So with the caveats noted at the outset, 
Um, we're aware of these reports and allegations, and also that Clover has denied violations of law. Uh, moving on to the, the waiver request specifically, the standard for a waiver uh, comes out of uh, the board's ACO oversight rule in 5601, and the board may waive applications of any provision of the rule upon such conditions the board requires in order to prevent unnecessary hardship or delay, in order to prevent injustice or for other good cause. Uh, and that's unless precluded by the rule itself or the statute. And I don't believe in this case it either the rule or the statute would preclude a waiver. Uh, Clover requested waiver of board rule 5.4 and rule 5.5. So, um, what this um, somewhat inartfully presents is uh, a decision tree, something resembling a decision tree for the board. Uh, so with respect to the um, request for a waiver of Rule 5.4, the board has an initial, uh, what I think is an initial question of whether to grant the waiver or not grant the waiver. Uh, if the board decides to grant the waiver, there are a series of subsequent questions um, that would be helpful for the board to consider. Um, uh, for what duration is the waiver? Uh, is it conditioned on the number of attributed lives and Clover being a Medicare-only ACO? Uh, other conditions um, and whether certain reporting would be required of Clover. Um, I've listed a couple of examples here like a list of participating providers in Vermont, um, terms of provider contracts uh, with Vermont providers, a shared savings loss plan, um, information needed to determine uh, if it's scale qualifying under the APM, should also note the number of attributed lives in Vermont, um, perhaps quality metrics or uh, perhaps other information not identified in this slide. Alternatively, if the board does not decides not to grant Clover's request for a waiver, uh, it seems there are two uh, possible courses following that um, that decision. The first would be to adopt a position of monitoring, um, uh, monitoring Clover, requiring certain reporting, and doing that pending the board's development of budget guidance uh, for an ACO like Clover that has fewer than uh, 10,000 lives. If the board did not want to go with the uh, monitoring only position, then the board could not grant a waiver and require budget review and approval. Um, given that the both the statute and the rule provide uh, a the board the flexibility to tailor the budget uh, review and approval process for an ACO with fewer than 10,000 lives. That budget review uh, could be done based on information Clover has submitted to date, or could be information submitted to date plus any additional information requested by the board uh, and is required as part of the budget review uh, process. There's some uh, further question there as to which of the statutory criteria the board deems appropriate um, to Clover based on its size and scope. Uh, the second part of Clover's request is for a waiver of the monitoring and enforcement rule. Um, this one is a slight, slightly different, I think, because you, the board could consider a waiver of, the, of rule 5.5 no waiver of 5.5 or, or a partial waiver, meaning a waiver of specific sections within 5.5. And I find it kind of helpful to think about 5.5 in terms of um, aspects of the rule that require compliance with board orders and allow the board to discretionarily, uh, <laughs> allow the board to um, assert specific requests or um, make specific requests of Clover and um, take specific remedial action on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, requirements that 
require Clover's ongoing compliance without specific board direction. Those would be uh, aspects like the record keeping requirement, um, which the board might find is already covered uh, by Clover's requirements as participating as a direct contracting entity, and also some of the public reporting aspects of 5502 um, that require Clover to post certain information to its website, the board could determine are adequately covered um, already by the requirements that Clover is subject to um, from CMS. And so that, I, I hope, is a helpful framing of, uh, of this discussion, and uh, I will pause there. Thank you, Russ. Do board members have questions for Russ? So this is Robin. I don't have um, specific questions this moment, but I did think it might make sense for us to have a little bit of a discussion around where we are on the two questions. And as part of that, um, if we have questions related that where we really need advice from our general counsel, I do think that would be most appropriate in an executive session. But I was thinking there's probably some more general discussion we might have before that, but I don't know. So I'm happy to kick that off, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. Appreciate that, Robin. Shall I kick it off? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, so um, when I'm thinking about this question, um, I think there are two different considerations that I'm weighing. Um, on the one hand, uh, this is a Medicare only small uh, direct contracting ACO program that involves one Vermont practice and a limited number of Vermont lives. And I do think that it that our regulatory process must appropriately reflect the scope uh, of the Vermont business. So, um, so that is one consideration. I think it would be inappropriate to do the type of um, budget review that we do, for example, for one care, given that this is much smaller and includes one practice. Now, with you know, if Clover did attract more business as they indicated they were hoping to do, that consideration changes over time. But given sort of today's snapshot with one provider and uh, no pr pr preferred providers and a uh, small number of people, that's kind of where we are today. So that's one thing that I'm sort of thinking about when I'm thinking through this process. Um, the other piece, as Russ said, is that um, you know, they we we don't have the authority to certify them. So it's not a question, as he said, of whether they can operate or not operate. It's a question of what kind of parameters and public reporting and transparency is appropriate. Um, and then the the third consideration that is swirling around in my head is um, that I this is for Vermont a new model. There. There are, um, you know, I think we, we got a little bit of a sense of the model of care that is embedded in the Clover Health app. Um, I don't feel like I totally understand how that fits in with the statewide vision for payment delivery system reform um, in terms of care management and, and not having duplicative or redundant systems, which we as a state, as a small state, try to not increase duplicative uh, sort of efforts. Um, so I think for me, um, I am probably leaning towards um, one of the no waiver options. Um, 
and I don't know, and I, that's where I would need to have further discussion with our general counsel to determine um, uh, which path, as Russ has outlined on the slide, makes more sense. Um, in terms of the monitoring and enforcement, I'm not, given the amount of information that I know and sort of the uncertainty about growth, of Clover over time, I'm not particularly comfortable with a complete waiver there. Um, I would need to think a little bit more about the 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 kind of middle ground, which is where I think I probably would be more likely to land. Whereas if it's a reporting requirement that CMS has covered, I don't, you know, and this is duplicative. I'm sympathetic to not creating that duplication. On the other hand, I wouldn't want to waive the enforcement ability. Um, so, so that's kind of where I'm at. I think, um, you know, I do think that there are some interesting aspects that they described about their model. For example, the um, getting some getting a patient who's been discharged from the hospital in with their primary care provider provider very quickly. Uh, or ensuring that there's some other uh, appropriate touch point, as long as that's connected back and the care is coordinated with the primary care provider, that could be really good for Vermont patients. I think that's often a place where our system currently falls short. And um, just speaking from personal experience, I had a family member who had an injury and, you know, it it took basically me getting in, getting in there to get the care coordinated and and organized and that still took a week so that aspect some of those aspects of improving that communication and kind of speeding up that care process for vermonters i think are interesting also um you know there has been some discussion in the state about um you know whether or not one aco makes sense i you know i tend to fall in the camp of we're a small state we don't want to have a lot of redundant uh administrative processes, but at the same time, you know, uh, healthcare in most of the country is a marketplace. And so we're not completely immune from that, regardless of what my personal opinion is. Um, so sorry if that was a bit rambling, but that I'm just sort of thinking out loud to share um, kind of where I am. So it wasn't rambling and I appreciate it uh, very much, Robin. Um, I too have come to um, a similar place, although I'm not sure that we're in the exact same place at this point in time. But um, for a number of reasons, I don't believe that we should just be granting the uh, waiver. And um, with that being said, I think there are some difficulties that uh, we have to address as far as the fact that um, this is a calendar year entity that started um, in April of this year in Vermont. So we don't get a real um, full year from their first year. Um, and that's going to create some difficulties. I think it would be very difficult for staff to put together um, a reporting process um, rapidly. So I don't think that 21 truly is an option for reporting, but I do think that um, there has to be some common ground here. And I mentioned it at uh, last week's meeting when I asked uh, the vice president uh, of Clover if um, there couldn't be a way to align the reporting. And basically, the, I'm not looking to duplicate anything that CMS is already requiring from them, but I am looking to make sure that Vermont and Vermonters are held whole and uh, by that, um, we didn't really hear a concrete um, way in which the savings were going to be in a meaningful way um, to offset the $45 fee that they're paying just to have someone open up the uh, program. And uh, there were more I thought more questions raised than answers received at last week's meeting. And that makes it very difficult to um, come to a conclusion. But one thing is is for certain that we, we likely share their goals on the care coordination. 
And um, this is something that has been integral to Vermont's healthcare reform efforts dating well before um, the all-payer model. It goes back to Blueprint for Health and even prior to that with the community teams. And uh, that's something that um, could be very beneficial to Vermont. But at this point, there's no guarantees that whatever is siphoned out of Vermont um, is going to be uh, beneficial in my mind until we actually get a report of some results. And so um, for that reason, I'm kind of leaning on the, the no waiver as well um, in a modified way. And uh, that's where I'm coming from. Other members of the board? Sure, I'll jump in too. Um, you know, I think you've both, um, you know, put put out good, good scenarios, and I, I'm looking at, you know, also a modified waiver here. I mean, I I think we're um, not going to go with a waiver. I guess is is my answer. It would be, um, but but a modified waiver. And I'm not as concerned. I think this is going to evolve over time. So, yes, you know. We, they may be on a different calendar, and we it may take us time to get what types of reporting that we need. Um, so I think the first decision is really are we waiver or no waiver, right? And 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 then once we get beyond that, and it's it seems like we have three on the no waiver, so we'd have to see you know where the other two are. You know then it becomes what 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 will we do? And I don't want to um, be overly restrictive on them as to what we're requesting you know certainly it's it's they're small right now they may grow to be bigger they may get over the 10,000 and at that point you know th there may be additional needs that we have but you know I, I would like to work with the data that we have um, you know and so maybe a waiver with the budget review based on the information that we have we'll be able to ask questions and you know and kind of continue down that process. Um, they're already here, they're, they're already in the state, you know, they're allowed to be doing that. It's just a matter then of what requirements we put on them and whether they adhere to those or not and if and what enforcement would be if if they don't. So um, you know I'm certainly in the no waiver, but um, you know, in a very modified version on what we'll request, what information we'll request and working with our staff on what that would be. Thank you, Maureen. Others? Well, I think that we seem to all be coming to a consensus here, um, at least that there probably isn't going to be a straight up waiver. Um, some kind of partial waiver, modified waiver is where I'm at as well. You know, again, we don't have the authority to determine whether they can operate in the state or not. They're here, they're operating. The question is what kind of monitoring, what kind of budget review, what kind of uh, actions we can take within our statutory authority. Uh, I feel like I need more information as Chair Mullen said, I feel like more questions were raised last week than answers. Um, I do, however, think that the regulation should also reflect the scope. And as Robin said, um, you know, right now it's limited to one practice and very few lives, but they did talk last week about growing quite substantially. So I think our, our oversight will have to, you know, pivot with that and grow with that. Uh, potentially, I see some, you know, this potentially could be an innovative model. This could be great for Vermonters if there's more data on cost and quality than, than providers have had access to before at their fingertips um, at the point of service. I think that's great. There's enhanced funding for primary care providers, which we know primary care providers need. Um, so that's that's helpful. Uh, so I, you know, there's, there's, I see pros and cons. I, I, um, I, you know, I'd like to hear from our general counsel on some of the legal issues. I think an executive session would be helpful. Um, you know, I, my sense is I need more information. I'm not comfortable with a full waiver. Um, I'm comfortable with a modified waiver, possibly some review with the information that we have. Not trying to increase administrative burden, but making sure that, uh, you know, that we're doing right by Vermonters here. Thank you, Jess. Tom. Uh, so I, I think I'm in the pack here. Um, the uh, you know my concern is is in part timing. I mean we're in, in the middle of negotiating an extension on the all payer model, and, uh, and 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 possibly renewal. And I'm you know I, I, I'm I'm concerned uh, if I don't understand. Um, 
that, you know, here is CMS possibly injecting another player or supporting another player into the Vermont scene. And I don't, I don't know whether they compete with each other or they're compatible. So there are some kind of market issues there that I, I just want to know more about. Um, I, I do think that a waiver of a short period of time will help some of these uh, securities and exchange issues kind of play out a little bit more um, uh, because they're unresolved. At this, they're just allegations at this point, uh, by and large, but but uh, un, you know uh, not fully re uh, um, resolved. And I'd like to find out more from CMS what we can have of their file. Um, I did ask the question, you know, uh, you know, they clearly said that in their presentation to CMS, C, uh, CMS, Vermont data would be bundled with the entire, uh, you know, operation, and uh, so uh, the Vermont data wouldn't be, dis you know, dis distinguishable. And I don't know whether or not that's true or not, but I'd, I'd like for us to have a conversation with CMS to figure out uh, um, what is the maximum amount of transparency we can have about uh, an operation in Vermont that is serving upwards of 5,000 people, which is 5,000 Vermonters that uh, we have to be concerned about. So if, if, if we're going to rely on, CM, on CMS's data, I, you know, I want to have a solid sense of what it is that we can have on a routine basis not filing a Freedom of Information Act, but on a routine basis uh, for a near-term waiver, possibly, um, and uh, and take that into consideration. I know that uh, both uh, Jess and Robin mentioned that they would like to uh, hear from the legal team um, in executive session. Um, is there anyone who wishes to make a motion concerning that at this time? I can do that. Um, so, all right, hold on just one second. I'm pulling up my background material because these ones are a little bit complicated and not good to do off the top of your head. Um, so the motion that I would like so there are two motions that I think we would need before going into executive session. And so the first motion I would like to make is that we find that the premature general public knowledge of the legal advice of our counsel regarding Clover Health's waiver request would clearly place the board at a substantial disadvantage in any challenge that may arise out of our board out of our board decision. So the the motion then is that we find that that is the case because we are required to make a specific finding. Yeah, I'll second that. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show it was unanimous vote. Robin, you said you had a second motion. Yes, uh, now I would move that we go into executive session to consider confidential attorney client communications regarding Clover Health's waiver request under the provisions of 1 VSA section 313A1F. Um, I'll second it. Okay, I am looking at the clock and I just want to be able to give a time certain that um, the board will come back into public uh, session. So I am going to um, set that time at noon where we will come back into uh, public session. And um, with that, um, all those in favor of the motion, um, please uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. So thank you. Um, we will be um, recessed from the public session until 12 noon. And uh, board members, I believe that you have been sent uh, uh, a link for a possible executive session from Abigail. And if you could exit this meeting and, and go to that meeting, it would be helpful. And with that, I just want to make it clear that it's not just the board members, it's also the legal team and the appropriate policy staff.
We'll see everyone else at noon. So welcome back to the Green Mountain Care Board. And um, we just completed a discussion with our legal team about um, the legal um, options that were available to the board. And um, with that, we're about to continue discussions on a request for a waiver by Clover Health Partners, LLC. And um, with that, I will open it up for um, board discussion. I'll jump in. This is Robin. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks. That was, it was helpful to me to be able to get our legal advice from our attorneys. And um, now that I feel like uh, I'm clear on a, on those issues, um, I would actually be ready to move um, uh, to make a motion, but I don't want to be premature if other board members had items they wanted to discuss before I do that. Well, they could still discuss those items even after you make a motion. All right, then I'm just going to go for it. Uh, so I, I move that the Green Mountain Care Board uh, deny Clover Health's request for a waiver from uh, the ACO budget process. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, further discussion from the board? I think the only other, I would just reiterate, you know, uh, I, uh, for me, uh, it is important to have some process. It will be important to ensure that that process is tailored to the size and scope of a Medicare ACO uh, program. So um, I, I just, I, I do think it should be clear um, and I think it will be clear. I have a second motion I'll make if we approve this one um, that we certainly are not expecting that Clover would be submitting a budget under the existing ACO guidance that's out there, given that that's tailored to a different process. But I, I do think it's important to have transparency in our process. And since we are trying to implement a statewide model to understand new market entrants and their role in that statewide model. So before we go to a, a vote, I'm going to open it up for any public comment on this discussion about Clover Health Part Partners' request for a waiver under Rule 5. Is there any public comment? Seeing and hearing none, is there any further board discussion? Hearing none, um, the motion before us, uh, and again, who seconded it? Maureen, Maureen, thank you. Just wanted to make sure that I had made sure there was a second. <laughs> um, is that the, um, the Green Mountain Care Board deny Clover Health Partners LLC a request for a waiver under um, Rule 5? Um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show as a unanimous vote. And I believe, Robin, I heard you say that you may have a second motion. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I would move that the board delegate to our legal and policy team um, the task of coming up with a budget process and reporting criteria that are appropriate to the size and scope of Clover Health Partners. Um, and that also that that process would include input both from Clover Health and from the Healthcare Advocates Office. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, is there discussion from the board? I think it was probably clear from what I said before, but I, I think that um, having our staff work with the stakeholders um, would be important so that we can make sure that the regulatory process is appropriately sized. Um, and I think that that will also be a, 
by delegating it to our staff, it'll be a more expeditious process than trying to do it through our public board meeting process. Of course, uh, it would be necessary for that uh, to come back to us um, once it's developed. Thank you, Robin. Um, is there other board discussion? Before I open it up to uh, public comment, I just want to, I see that uh, Eric Schulteis is uh, um, on this meeting, and I just want to make sure that the healthcare advocate is comfortable with um, helping to provide input in this process of developing what is the proper reporting. Hi, Kevin. Uh, of course, we, we are. Thank Working you, Eric. And I'm not sure if I see anybody from Clover Health, but I would assume it would be in their best interest to uh, provide input. So um, with that, I'm going to open it up to public comment on the motion that's in front of us. And that motion is to delegate to the Green Mountain Care Board legal and policy teams the responsibility for working with input from the um, healthcare advocate and from Clover Health Partners on what would be uh, 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 proper and non-duplicative um, reporting. So with that, members of the public. And budget process. And budget process, yes. Members of the public. Again, hearing none, I'll send it back to the board. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that this motion passed unanimously as well. Um, thank you, Russ. Um, it was very helpful discussion and um, we look forward to hearing back from you and the policy team about uh, you know what the next step should be. So good luck in your journey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> With that, um, I'm going to move to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board at this time? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board at this time? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved by member Yusufer and seconded by member Lunge to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that we adjourned unanimously. And thank you everyone for um, a productive morning.